வணக்கம் ஃப்ரெண்ட்ஸ் திஸ் இஸ் ஏஆர் ஆர் எம் அருண் ஐ எம் பிரசிடெண்ட் ஆஃப் த சதர்ன் இண்டியா சேம்பர் ஆஃப் காமர்ஸ் அண்ட் இண்டஸ்ட்ரி சிக்கி ஆன் பிஹாஃப் ஆஃப் சிக்கி வி வுட் லைக் டு விஷ் ஈச் ஒன் ஆஃப் யூ ஜாயினிங் அஸ் ஃப்ரம் இண்டியா அ வெரி குட் மார்னிங் அண்ட் ஆன் பிஹாஃப் ஆஃப் சிக்கி அகெயின் வி வுட் லைக் டு விஷ் ஈச் ஒன் ஆஃப் யூ ஜாயினிங் அஸ் ஃப்ரம் சிங்கப்பூர் அ வெரி குட் ஆஃப்டர்நூன் கண்டினியூவிங் ஆன் ஆன் பிஹாஃப் ஆஃப் சிக்கி வி வுட் லைக் டு எக்ஸ்டெண்ட் அ வார்ம் வெல்கம் டு ஈச் ஒன் ஆஃப் யூ வி ஆர் பர்டிகுலர்லி கிளாட் டு ஹேவ் வித் அஸ் டுடே another esteemed guest mr vijay ayangar who is the founder and the chairman of agrocorp international private limited singapore we are extremely glad to have him with us this is another individual who has been extremely successful globally and uh, more so in the much sought after industry which is agriculture which is extremely exciting for us to have uh, uh, gotten him on board uh, for today's session for uh, those of you who are joining us for the first time on the sikki 360 uh, series this is a monthly series that we have uh, been running we launched it in uh, october of 2020 and we are extremely glad that uh, this is today our 24th session we have had 23 eminent guests so far and and continuing forth we have another eminent guest today to have made it uh, a successful continuously run 24 sessions avani can we have the slide please before you see the before i go through the slide that you will be seeing in front of you i would like to draw your attention to the names and numbers of two of our uh, executives listed in the bottom of this slide request you to please uh, take note of it if any of you have any trouble reconnecting during the course of today's uh, conversation please feel free to give our executives a call and they'll be glad to to assist you as i was saying earlier Sikki 360 is a monthly series that has been running continuously since October of 2020 not uh, uh, it says 2022 here but it's actually 2020 you know we orient this to be a extremely active live uh, lively discussions with our eminent guests we have a stringent criteria for choosing our guests we look for guests who are experts in their respective fields and uh, who share with us their all round path to excellence we typically look for guests who have at least three decades of experience in the respective industry and uh, as well as society contribution this of course is an apolitical platform we wanted to give it a name that uh, depicts a multidimensional perspective because that's what these uh, programs are about to give a, a 360 a degree perspective on on our guest and uh, our guest inputs for uh, society at large the format that we follow for this program is we go through five distinct sessions sections uh, regarding each uh, each of our guests we first start with our guest expertise second we talk about our guest organization and their role within their organization third we talk about our guest career path fourth we talk about our guest inputs for the next generation and finally we talk about our guest inputs for society we would certainly like you the audience to uh, to uh, participate along with us please feel free to use the online uh, chat uh, session and our sikki 360 team will be glad to uh, moderate the questions and feed it into the session so that they are answered there are very uh, there are very uh, uh, simple two guidelines that we follow as part of this program number one is we want our guests to be at comfort at all points of time in, in all ways possible because we want to be able to invite our guests back to this program that is number one and number two is we would uh, definitely like you to gain out of your participation in this program so these are the two very simple guidelines that we follow with those few words about sikki 360 I would now like to share with you a few words about our esteemed guest for today Mr Vijay Ayengar. He holds a bachelor's degree from IIT Mumbai and has an MBA from the Cornell University in New York. He is the founder chairman of AgroCorp International Private Limited. This was this company was established in Singapore in 1990 and this is an integrated agricultural commodity and food solutions provider. They have offices in 15 countries. and uh, sales of over 3.4 billion dollars they have customers across the globe spanning southeast asia south asia Ch- india china middle east and east africa they also have food processing plants in canada australia india and myanmar this is uh, uh, in addition to agrocorp international mr vijay ayangar is chairman emeritus of another sikki which is the, actually the singapore indian chamber of commerce and industry one of the well known uh, chambers of commerce in singapore he was the former he is the former vice chairman of the singapore business federation and currently he is executive vice president of the global pulse confederation and also currently director of the grain and feed trade association 
GAFTA in London. In March of 2022, he was conferred the Distinguished Alumni Award by IIT Mumbai. With these few words, we would like to again welcome Mr. Vijay Ayangar to today's program. Mr. Vijay, welcome. Keep dear Karina. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Arun. Thanks for uh, hosting me here, and uh, it's really an honor and privilege to be part of Sticky 360. Sticky is, is a name that's very dear to me as well because I served as the chairman of the Singapore Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, which is also referred to in Singapore as Sticky. And uh, it, it, we, we, uh, it's something that, that, uh, that brings back a lot of uh, uh, good recollections and uh, memories. I've also visited uh, uh, Chennai on official delegations, and uh, with the last we did was one with, uh, which was led by the Home Minister, Mr. Shanmugam, and uh, at that time we had met with the uh, with with your chamber as well, and uh, you know I think there's good interactions between the two chambers at this moment. Good to know that, Mr. Vijay. So getting right into the first section on on your expertise. Of course, agriculture is definitely very uh, interesting to us, running a successful business out of agriculture. On top of that, you are extremely successful in, uh, in commodities uh, trading, agri-commodities uh, trading. What factors really drew you into this field? And uh, what skill sets do you feel are required to excel in this, apart from a basic understanding of the market? Basically, when I did my uh, internship uh, during my MBA, I interned with, with a futures company which was uh, active in the Chicago Board of Trade. So I spent uh, uh, three months there, and then I also inter interned with another company, uh, which was in the same business in, in Connecticut. One of the things that really drew me was the... This, this, this business is one of the oldest in the world because it's uh, the, the commodity uh, business and the business where uh, foodstuff except from one part of the world that produces it to another part that consumes it has been uh, prevalent since time immemorial. I mean, uh, to give you an instance, the the uh, uh, Brazil is, is such an important player in the sugar industry now, and uh, uh, the initial uh, cane that, that went to Brazil to set up the industry came from uh, from India. So a lot of a lot of different uh, uh, examples over history uh, uh, really uh, uh, draw the important. Uh, status that that uh, this business enjoys in the world, and uh, you know, when 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 I was interning, I found that uh, particularly uh, the dynamics of the market, understanding the market dynamics, making sure that uh, uh, the uh, uh, how making sure uh, that uh, the futures market in, uh, is relevant to what is happening in the physical market was something was one of the projects that I did many, many years ago, and that's something which really deeply attracted me to the business. Your question on, on uh, what what are the dynamics that, uh, that shape up anybody's, uh, you know, the, the, the background to somebody wanting to be successful in this industry is, as like like most industries, you've got to have, first, you've got to appreciate uh, the, the, the business that you're in. You have to make sure that uh, you understand all the dynamics that, that that constitute the business. You have to make sure that you have a keen uh, sense of business analytics because, you know, it's very easy to say that, oh, I just buy this and sell it somewhere else. Well, then you, you, you've got to be alive to, uh, to the needs of your customer as well as the needs of your, uh, your the, the farmer or the supply chain that you the purchase the goods from. And uh, this, this basically... Uh, for this, you have to spend an extended amount of time understanding what you bring to the landscape and what is your role in the business. So all of these factors, the understanding of, of your role in the business, understanding you know, exactly what, uh, what, are the, what, what are the elements that you bring to the table, and, and then understanding the risk involved in, in the business are, are the key uh, uh, factors for, for success. When we look at the Indian economy today, we are at about three billion, uh, three hundred billion, uh, three trillion dollars. Sorry, uh, three trillion dollars, and uh, it's of course continuing to grow. But when we were to um, uh, go back, uh, say to the 18th century or 19th century before colonization, 
we were perhaps much uh, uh, one of the biggest in the world uh, uh, compared to what we are today. And after the British Raj, we certainly uh, came down. But when we were doing very well uh, as a as an economy, we were uh, uh, we were, our economy was based on on commodities trading, on uh, especially on spices and uh, and so on. Uh, of course, we can say that the the British colonization kind of brought things down. But because this has been inherent within us, uh, why did it take us so long for us to get back on track? And uh, why are we still quite behind compared to the world commodities uh, trading market, rather than being much ahead even after so many years? I, I you know, the the colonization was obviously one of the huge factors by which uh, I think the Indi Indian industry also changed because then we became a supplier of raw materials to the world and finished goods coming back rather than any any form of uh, uh, you know uh, converting the, the raw materials into finished goods. But uh, you know I think over the last uh, 10, 20, 25 years, India has made huge strides. Uh, you know in the 60s and the 70s when when we were growing up, there was the Green Revolution. Lots of, uh, you know, from from being a net uh, food deficit country, we became a we became self-sufficient, and that itself was the first ride. Since then, I think in the last ten or twenty years, with with the dynamics of the government, as you know, the levers usually most governments tend to form then tend to have some kind of a balancing role that they that they play between the supplier and the consumer or the producer and the consumer. Because on one hand, the producer needs to be rewarded for whatever uh, he's producing. And then the consumer doesn't want to pay you know, extraordinary prices because then it, it, it contributes to inflation over, and overall, you know, most of these, uh, most of the commodities tend to be food related. So uh, in a way, I think governments generally have, have been moderately successful in changing the landscape. And I think currently this government has also been involved in this, in the sense that they have set goals of increasing uh, farmer income. And if you look at uh, some of the uh, some of the areas that the farmers have been active in, for example, this year, with global wheat prices in the, in the, the, the international landscape of, of wheat, particularly uh, with the backdrop of the of the Russian-Ukrainian uh, situation, international wheat prices were high and India started exporting. As a result of which, I think domestic prices also went up and the farmer was rewarded to a great degree. At the same time, I think the government also wanted to have some amount of control on domestic inflation. So, you know, there are uh, balancing acts that the governments have to, have to play. And I think over time, uh, the Indian situation has definitely uh, improved in terms of uh, production of food grains and in terms of overall uh, surpluses. India runs, uh, India this year ran a surplus in wheat, ran a surplus in sugar, ran a surplus in corn. And all of these uh, will will keep continuing bar uh, the odd failure that you have uh, in, in terms of um, uh, rains or anything like that. India is a peculiar country because as a developing country and a large developing country, it's impossible to to uh, to tailor your food economy to exports only. So you have to, you have to have a balancing role between your domestic consumers and the export market at the same time, making sure that whatever you do is rewarding to the uh, to the producer. So the the minimum support prices and other price mechanisms that the government follows have, you know, have played the role in encouraging more and more production. At the same time, of course, you know, the governments, with with whatever is happening globally, governments have to be more and more responsive to uh, price uh, movements and dynamics. When we continue on looking at India, agriculture forms about 15% of our economy and forms about 42% of our employment. Certainly this sector needs continuing reforms as we move forward. There's also, as you say, a lot of uh, subsidies that are given in India. How would you compare our subsidies to what's given globally? And uh, what else do you think needs to be done to strengthen the sector? I think one of the things that, uh, I think the subsidies that India gives 
is probably you know subsidies in different countries take different mechanisms and uh, in, i think in india the absence of insurance crop insurance and other uh, factors that some of the western economies and developed economies have the the subsidies that india uh, offers is more in terms of minimum support price and occasionally when you want to dispose of surpluses you will need you give some form of transport subsidy or you give some form of export subsidy some of which have attracted the attention of wto and other uh, uh, governments which have uh, which have sometimes taken the indian government to wto some of the cases are still uh, uh, under the purview of wto so i i think it's very difficult to uh, to sort of uh, tailor subsidies and you know each each country subsidizes to its own uh, to the own way that 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 suits them for example europe country european countries used to pay farmers not to farm not to till the land and keep it fallow but now with with food prices the way they are i think that's something which is that that's a policy that's backfired on people so i think this year for example in sugar india did not need to subsidize at all because the international sugar prices were higher than domestic prices so by and large there was no need of subsidy so essentially you hope to get to the point when uh, perhaps the the import and the export flow can be uh, can be done without subsidies i think the recent agriculture act that the indian government tried to pull through would have been a step in the right direction obviously it was it was but drawn i really do hope that at some point in time it will uh, it will come back because i think it's very important that uh, you know certain uh, parts of that uh, the, the agriculture act would have been useful to reviving industry and i think uh, some of the some of the parts uh, involve movement of uh, movement of agriculture goods from one part of the country to another and so on all of those would have been very useful to 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 maintaining a maintaining something which is which which i think would would uh, would be very useful uh, uh for india in the years to come the russia ukraine war has had a debilitating impact on several industries agriculture certainly is one and as a result of this countries like argentina and, and in, uh, even india have tried to regulate exports food exports wheat exports in order to be able to uh, keep uh, prices internally low do you feel this is sustainable and importantly also today the the un head as the un chief has said that the war is not going to end anytime soon it's going to continue in the long term so when only do you think uh, this food situation will stabilize for the good of uh, the people see this there are a couple of uh, uh, underlying themes in all of this when any if when any country plays a, a disproportionate role in global trade flows any uh, issues uh, impeding exports from that country will 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 have an impact on global prices and will have at least uh, a temporary impact on global trade flows for you know just a couple of instances but in russia and ukraine they the they form to close to 25% of global wheat trade or exports when 25% of the global wheat exports is, is impeded in exports obviously there's going to be a there's going to be some impact on prices initially since the indian market was was not on par with international market the indian uh, exports could could be feasible until the government decided to put a stop on them saying that hey maybe this would this would impede this would impact on our domestic market and and uh, there were all, there were also this, there was also this feeling that uh, perhaps the crop was not as good as they thought it was similarly for you know just a few days ago the indian government also imposed some restrictions on rice export again india is the world's largest rice exporter so obviously there's going to be some impact on international prices in terms of food grains one of the things that you know that that i learned when i started in this business 
and this is something which is sort of the mantra, is there is no cure to high prices in high places. So essentially what happens is that when there is when there is when when uh, there are high prices, the farmer responds. And usually you will find that within the dynamics of whatever he's planting, there will be response globally in terms of responding to the situation. So if you look, you know, last year, last year there was there was a drought in the U.S. and Canada, and uh, as a result of which, when this situation emerged, the the, the war took, started in February. So there is usually there are no new crops coming for commodities like wheat during that period, except there is a small crop comes in, which comes in uh, in South America in the period of November December. So this period of February when the war started. Perhaps, you know, there may have been a reason for the war to come in that period because there is no harvesting also in Ukraine during that period. So it would not have impacted anything in the food because it was just the remnants of the old Russia, the Canadian US drought, which was impacting global prices. But exactly at the wrong time, this war took place and it, it jumped up uh, uh, wheat prices and oil seed prices to a to, 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 uh, very, very. Uh, you know, um, to high, very, very high levels. And this was something which, which once, normally every uh, uh, northern, uh, uh, North American crops or European crops come in August, September. And these crops are already there, so they have, they have sort of put a dampener on uh, global uh, grain prices, particularly with uh, Canada and the U.S. coming back to normal. So in a way, the prices have retreated from the highs that the uh, the Russians and the Ukrainians have agreed on some basic principles to keep flows going from, uh, uh, continuing to flow from Russia and Ukraine. The countries which have been maximum impacted in this are poorer South, uh, South Asian countries, both Bangladesh and uh, uh, Pakistan are big importers of wheat, and they have been impacted. Countries like Indonesia, for example, is the second largest importer in the world. Egypt is the largest importer. So these are the countries that have been impacted. And, of course, countries in Africa, which buy uh, these grains, which is which, I mean, Russia and Ukraine typically have been, have been some of the cheapest grains in the world. So this really means that there's no solution until the war completes? There, there will be some response from farmers in other parts of the world. So I don't think uh, the same condition will uh, will uh, continue. There may be a little bit of a, a loss of market share for Russia and Ukraine in the years to come, because everybody will realize that perhaps you have to diversify your food flows. flows. Just like in everything, including your own industry, the, the biggest uh, conundrum before policymakers and before uh, industrialists is how to diversify your supply chain. Mr. Vijay, we now move on to the second section, which is your organization and your role within the organization. AgroCorp's policy is, quote, following the business and nature of businesses, unquote. How do you do this? And uh, what changes do you see in buyer behavior over the years? And how do you adjust to these changes? Basically, the way when we set it up in uh, 1990, our, uh, our, uh, because, you know, the, the, the field that, I, that I'm in is, is a very, very large field. Potentially, there are very, 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 very big players. And we are a medium-sized player in, in, in this business with our $3.5 million worth of business. When we set up the business, our, the, the, the philosophy basically was twofold. One was that uh, we would either understand a geography completely and work in it, or we understand a commodity completely and work in it. So we stick to verticals that we completely understand and geographies that we understand. And that is that is the way that we have grown. So once we reach a certain size in a vertical, then we say, hey, we, we understand this product. Well, let's go for new markets. And in each market that we work in, we fulfill a, re, a, a need in, in that market. 
So, for example, in government tenders around the world, we've been very active. Basically, in the you know, let's say if we trace back to the start of COVID, one of the things that uh, that people understood uh, during the beginning of COVID was that supply chains would be impacted. Nobody knew in what way. Everybody decided that uh, that the best way to to uh, to bide through this uh, the pandemic would be to uh, to uh, sort of uh, tighten your reins, hold your you know your cards close to your chest, and uh, you know work work on things on a on a day to day kind of uh, uh, you know looking at taking each day as it comes. One of the things that COVID really brought to the uh, forefront was that the food business continues. Whatever whatever happens. Agriculture flows continues, food business continues, and the world finds a way to continue this business. We, then governments came into tender because every government was interested in stockpiling for their own population because they did not know what kind of closures will will come. For example, if, if you know, there were times when uh, when ports were closed, there were times when uh, uh, transport was a huge problem. For example, for example, we have uh, industries in Australia. In Australia, until a couple of months ago, uh, transporters could not move from one state to another. So as a result of which, if uh, you know, we our assets are in Queensland, we could not get any workers into Queensland. We could not get any trucks into Queensland. So that was that. You know, whatever whatever happened in Queensland stayed within Queensland. And and you know, for two years we could not visit, and neither could our people get out from there. So this the, this is the kind of uh, situation uh, that we were faced in, but. We realized that business, our business is, is, is continues, and in one way or the other, we found new trade flows. Countries like Singapore themselves decided that they had to stock up, so they issue tenders for various products. Some of which, you know, the government approached people like us to say, "Hey, you know, why don't you source it? This is a national national need." And this is the kind of uh, uh, you know opportunities that presented themselves, and uh, there were new new trade flows as well. When uh, you know, luckily with, with with whatever happened in Russia and Ukraine, Australia had a you know three years ago when we were when we had first invested in Australia, the the the, the feeling in Australia was one of over overwhelming uh, gloom because they said we always have droughts, we have a problem with water, and uh, Australia is not going to be a continent for uh, for agriculture anymore. And for the last three years, they've had fantastic rains, they've had they've had really really amazing harvests. And uh, the problems that they have been faced is that they are uh, they don't have enough ports and port capacity to export their grain. So Australia presented itself, presented itself, so we could export from Australia. India for uh, since uh, 2020 we were we were very early in the in the export uh, in exports out of India. We started in uh, 2020. We were one of the first players to market Indian grain effectively in, in the region, and. Uh, uh, we we were able to uh, market Indian grain uh, to various players who had never uh, before ever uh, taken Indian grain. So, so those are the kind of things that uh, that keep evolving, which makes our life interesting and keeps us on our toes as well. You are absolutely right in implying that the food business is is such a very important business because as long as there's life, there has to be food, and it's it's so important that each one involved with this business understands it that uh, they should enable it in all ways possible rather than trying to exploit it in any way. Having said that, we now move on to the next question, which is from the audience. This is from Mr. S.M. Shankar, who chairs one of Sikhi's most important committees, the Food Processing Committee, where we've been doing a lot of work in, in terms of bringing in technology into food processing and enabling people within uh, our, uh, our region in our country to be able to scale up. Mr. Shankar, can I request you to please go ahead? Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, it gives me a great opportunity. You, can you hear me? I can hear you, but we cannot see you. Okay, okay, sorry. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Vijay Ayengar. Really happy to uh, talk to you over this meeting. Uh, it's a great opportunity. And we have been doing a lot of good work on food and nutrition here in our chamber. And in fact, I take this opportunity to invite you once to our chamber as well. So my question is this, 
uh, you played a key role in uh, creating Singapore Pulse Federation and also international pulse trade with India. What were objectives and can India emerge as a leader in this sector? The uh, GPC is the global uh, umbrella body for uh, coordinating and uh, 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 representing the interests of the pulse industry. This uh, basically involves all the participants in the pulse industry, including uh, manufacturers, including uh, producers, including uh, uh, traders, including the whole, you know, encapsulating the whole uh, gamut across the industry. We work very closely with uh, multinational uh, and uh, multilateral agencies. You know, for example, we were instrumental uh, uh, three or four years ago for uh, for the United Nations to introduce uh, a day of the pulse, uh, the year of the pulse. This was in 2016 or 2017, one of the years was designated as the year of the pulse. And uh, uh, there was there were tremendous amount of uh, activities all around the world, including in the UN General Assembly, as well as in uh, various countries promoting the, uh, the health uh, benefits of using pulses and the environmental sustainability that pulse, that pulse crop brings to the table. Singapore Pulse Federation is also a similar kind of body. It represents the interests of the Singapore players in the pulse uh, industry. The uh, uh, GPC, for example, uh, has got representations in a number of uh, uh, different uh, sectors. And as, as you may be aware of, pulse uh, crop generally in the last few years, it, it really hit uh, uh, global headlines because uh, a pulse crops are uh, great for crop rotation because they give nitrogen to the soil. They tend to use less water and they can grow grow on hardy soil. Some of the pulse crops, like for example, mung beans and all, grows in 60, 60 days. So it's a quick rotation crop. And generally, uh, over the last few years, there's been a lot of research and work that's been done in establishing Pulse is a source of a vegetable protein, which is comparable to animal protein. The thinking behind that without espousing any particular approach is that as animal protein consumes, you know, whatever you do, the animal tends to uh, graze on grass or eat uh, uh, something like a soybean meal or, or whatever feed. That, that's also grown. So the quantum of water that is required to get animal protein is several times what is required for what is required to grow a pulse crop and establish and extract protein out of it. So the GPC also advocates that there should be a reasonable blend of plant protein in daily diet because of various uh, uh, benefits that that a in terms of sustainability that that uh, plant-based protein drinks, as well as in terms of uh, actual benefits that it does in terms of uh, allergen. It's usually not, a, there's no allergy to any of the pulse-based crops there is, uh, or the plant-based protein. And, and currently, plant-based protein forms not even 1% of global protein consumption in the world. So if you, if you, even if it extends to 2%, then it, it means that there's going to be a there's going to be some benefit to its sustainability and global environmentally, a global, and the global environment. So that is, you know, and, and usually the pulse crops are grown in the poorer countries in Africa. And India is, India is by the way, the world's largest pulse producer. So that's, that's the kind of, uh, you know, uh, power thing that these two organizations do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shankar, for, uh, for your question. Mr. Vijay, the next question is, it's, I found it very interesting to know that uh, having set up in Singapore in 1990, you set up your first overseas office in Yangon in 1992, which was two years after your incorporation. However, your office in India was set up only in 2006. Normally, the political stability and, and a vibrant democracy are, are key areas for anyone to expand their uh, their business globally. What factors 
convinced you to choose Myanmar over India? Basically, at that time, Myanmar was opening up. So, uh, the it was the first period that Myanmar opened up around the 1992. I think they Nevin had stepped down and they had a new government which was which was interested in uh, in uh, liberalisation. So, there were great opportunities uh, to work together in uh, in Myanmar, and uh, that's one of the reasons. And it wasn't going to be waiting for anybody because we were we were early in the game. and myanmar was always a big uh, producer of uh, agriculture at the time so we thought that by uh, by seizing the opportunity there we could also and they were starting from a very very low base so we thought with the presence of people like us going into the country we could uh, contribute positively in terms of their uh, the agriculture in terms of their growth and i think over the years myanmar has emerged as a significant player in the global global agriculture the market both they are big exporters of rice and they are exporters of uh, pulses as well india being uh, being the largest producer in the in the world india would produce something like 20 million tons of sorry 24 25 million tons of pulse a year even the short for the million tons of pulse in india it it's a bit difficult to find it in the in the world and uh, if myanmar becomes a, a producer of the 2 million tons of pulse it would be of interest to india and that's what they have been doing since the early 90s india of course you know by and large a lot of our management team is from india and we we felt that uh, that's something which we could handle from singapore and then move into india at a later stage so that was that was the that was the thinking behind we are sharing a few of your pictures that you shared with us uh with the audience so if you would like to add a few words about each of the pictures feel please feel free to do so that uh, takes us to the next question which is how does agrocorp see india and tamil nadu what are the opportunities and challenges that you have encountered also what lessons can tamil nadu learn from a country like singapore <laughs> it's a very interesting question basically uh, you know i'll just address the indian uh, agriculture question we I, i you know in india as you, as you rightfully mentioned when it when something employs 42% of the workforce and contributes 15% to the economy it is it it's it's something that nobody can take lightly but india has got its own dynamics because you know as as i mentioned a large country you really need to uh, track in policies that that are suitable and particular to you and those those necessarily may not fit in line with with whatever is happening elsewhere in the globe so in terms of business you know generally although most of us would would like to do would would like to invest in india and do uh, you know uh, contribute in whatever way we could it's india has been tough because generally uh, the 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 policy has been geared towards domestic consumption and domestic production and one of the key considerations that has always been on is to for example you know currently we 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 extract uh, as i told you when you when, when i saw you we extract uh, protein from pulses in canada one of the things that uh, that we were looking at was putting up a facility in india the 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 facility requires a lot of water which sometimes can be an issue in india but the other issue was that when you make an investment like that in agriculture is a sensitive uh, uh, part of of the of the landscape in india if, if there are going to be times when india is going to press on exports or there are going to be times when india is going to be pressing on imports or there are going to be times when they say there no more imports are allowed then as a manufacturer you will not have access to the cheapest source of raw material which which sometimes can be an hindrance to uh, certain industries that you have so essentially where india would offer, will give opportunity and this is this is particular in tamil nadu as well when if if, if, if you are producing using domestic uh, uh the raw material and then you are uh 
selling into the domestic market and they maybe then that will be where the uh, where the logic for investment will lie we now move on to the third you know, in singapore as well just to uh, singapore as well uh, you know similar to india singapore is you know a few years ago singapore launched this uh, 2030 uh, 30 by 30 policy which meant that because of covid and developments there the singapore government is interested to produce 30% of their food domestically by 2030 which itself is, is you know for a country that that thrives on globalization it seems to sort of uh, uh, get singapore into some hard uh, choices that they have to take so we we invested in a hydroponic facility so we are producing uh, uh, 18 greens using hydroponics in singapore the other thing that we do in singapore is also we produce we have we fund the research for producing uh, uh, proteins out of uh, using an enzyme based approach uh, from uh, from pulses not something which i think we will uh, we are looking to collaborate with researchers in india as well the 30 by 30 policy is definitely a ambitious one yeah, certainly i think uh, a state like tamil nadu can definitely gain from something like that we we'll, we'll definitely share this with the uh, um with our colleagues in the in the government we now move on to the tamil third Nadu, section uh, tamil nadu with, with whatever has been happening in tamil nadu it seems that there should be more room for cooperation on agriculture as well as in other things because singapore traditionally looks for uh, you know regular source of supply in you know whatever because singapore is a, is is a country that needs to import food from around the world and in in you know whenever you encounter situations like covid where different countries close down different uh, different exports there is there is a need to be to have a constant uh, and regular source of supply for your needs uh, we'll be glad to work with you mr vijay in case you have any ideas to increase the tamil nadu singapore connect specifically on agriculture we would be glad to hear your suggestions and and explore it uh, accordingly but uh, that can perhaps uh, be a separate conversation we now move on to the third section which is on your career path this is the first question within this section is from a student ms sanjana who's doing her triple e second year at svc chennai sanjana if you're online please uh, go ahead and if you can kindly turn on your video too oh sir yeah she joins Sanjana Good morning sir Sanjana we cannot see you Good morning sir Good morning Good morning Sanjana Sanjana please go ahead Sanjana, you are muted. Here, yeah, Ms. Sanjana, you can ask the question. We move on, Bhavani. I guess so, sir. Okay, so let's move on. Mr. Vijay, you had a, uh, you have an MBA from Cornell, and uh, you also landed in uh, the uh, Chicago Board of Trade. audible breaking up uh, sanjana but uh, try again sanjana okay i I'm, i'm sorry we have to move on considering uh, time so how do how do you feel uh, your mba assisted you mr vijay in in, in what you're doing today whatever education does is to develop the analysts develop the analytical behavior so whatever uh, you whatever i learned in engineering and whatever i learned in in uh, in an mba which was which was several decades ago is only relevant to your thinking process and uh, the the analysis that you bring to any situation so that that those are the only uh, 
those are the uh, the thought the 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 points that you carry forward in your career. In fact, uh, in Cornell, one of the one of my professors was uh, Richard Taylor, who subsequently won a Nobel Prize in behavioral theory. And uh, you know, behavioral theory is also something that you carry every day every day with you. So it's, there are lots of different those kind of things that you you learn. One of the uh, you know in MBA. The finance part of it is very important. We, you know, there were there were lots of analytical uh, courses that are uh, taken, like options, options theory, and so on. All of which is relevant to the commodities sector. The commodities, you know, the movement of commodity markets tends to be very, very. You can put a deep amount of analysis to the futures markets, and a lot of what happens in the futures markets is also relevant to the. Uh, to the physical markets as well, so there is there is quite a bit of analysis that that one does for uh, in uh, you know which is which is all the uh, the what you learn from from universities. Today, running a company, a private company that too, which is over a three and a half billion dollars in in sales with a with a global clientele, what would you say have been your key success factors? And uh, would you uh, would you say that you had mentors who have guided you uh, in the course of your career? You know, obviously, I mean, mentors are very important. Initially, my first uh, role was working for somebody in London, a Jewish gentleman called Sam Marshall. And you know, the first one or two years, I was taking the every meeting that he went to, irrespective of whatever uh, whoever uh, it was. So you you get to meet. Uh, Chiefs of companies, you get to meet chairmen of companies. All you're sitting in the meeting, just listening, not saying anything. But you know that itself was a, was a significant experience. A, you learn uh, uh, what uh, what uh, uh, makes for success, and you also learn what uh, what makes for failures as well. So both of those uh, you learned. One of the things that you, you I think. Uh, is is very important is that uh, you know I take each day as it comes. So for me, I never look at what's happened in the past or uh, what or what is the company that we have built up. I only look at today and I look at what I want to do tomorrow. So that is that's been always the focus, and I think that's something that that, that stood me in good stead. We tend to hire a lot of young people here, and we teach them the ropes as well. We uh, I think that's another thing that that we find has been uh, uh, very very uh, instrumental in our success as well. And uh, we uh, generally also, you know, uh, we I, I think uh, in terms of understanding market dynamics, in terms of understanding where the opportunities lie, and because of the way we are structured, we tend to be uh, uh, fairly quick. In uh, making decisions and following through to execution, so all of these are the factors that that has propelled us where we are. You know, I I don't consider this to be successful. I think you know, there are lots of uh, lots of areas, lots of milestones yet to be done. We now move on to the fourth section, which is your inputs on the next generation. Today, we find quite a few educated youth taking up farming as a profession. How do you think governments can propel this further? I think the governments, by and large, governments tend to propel things further by staying out of the way and allowing you know trade to continue or allowing business to continue. But agriculture is such a sensitive item that it's always going to be some amount of government involvement. But you see the kind of technology that has come in agriculture. You know, the, the you you go to the west in in Canada. There's a family of Four or five will be uh, farming uh, uh, a land size of uh, say 25,000 acres, and uh, they bring economy of scale, but purely by using technology. The exhaustive use of drones, exhaustive use of analytics on weather patterns, exhausting use of satellite information, exhaustive use of uh, uh, futures markets to to hedge themselves. So these, that's that's been the way that uh, uh, people have made successes. You know. The, the farmers in uh, in, in in developed economies uh, the the kind of return that they make 
from their uh, from their plot of land is is phenomenal on the other hand the indian farmer doesn't make the kind of return so it, it, it you know people uh, consumers may be may have to be prepared to pay more i think uh, you will have to get some way of reaching some economies of scale with fractured land holdings that's always a challenge and uh, that's something which with either by forming communities and making sure that uh, you know community organizations fulfill the needs of farmers in that area there may be some economy of scale but uh, one of the mechanization has always been a challenge if you do not have economies of scale i mean you you, you look at it it seems that uh, the return on land that that the that the indian farmer gets is not comparable to anything that uh, global farmers get our next question is uh, from the audience mr robert who's uh, a member of our msme sikki's msme committee mr robert please go ahead so we can go ahead and try to join here some issues in chat okay so um, when we look at the agriculture economy uh, mr vijay it has never been a, a big focus compared to the corporate economy in this context how do you think we should make ag the agriculture sector more attractive to the next generation i think agri agriculture plays i wouldn't say that uh, agriculture is more important or uh, the industrialization and uh, uh, you know the corporate sector is, is less important i think both of them are equally important and i think there are opportunities in agriculture some of the new developments that you've seen around the world including uh, what i spoke about earlier on plant based protein all of them will propel uh, more and more investment you see a lot of youngsters uh, who have gone in either uh, into the organic sector or into specific uh, there have been number of uh, uh, you know youngsters that i know who have gone into uh, agriculture with small pieces of land they will obviously need to uh, uh, become larger in order to make a dent or make a, a, an impact but in into let's say chemical free uh, agricultural produce a lot of different things are happening even even what we are doing in singapore in hydroponics you know there the yield that you can achieve by growing vertically with hydroponics can be several times uh, the kind of uh, 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 yields that you get using conventional agriculture as a result of which your pressure on land your pressure on on resources could be less but of course you need a certain amount of water and it also power intensive so these are the kind of things that uh, that that i think uh, as the government sort of uh, pop, at least gives more and more incentives for people to get into these kind of sectors you will see more and more of the youth move into it you know you keep reading of uh, people from the from the us the tech sector who can who can obviously work from anywhere they can they are sitting in in uh, in rural uh, uh, tamil nadu say and uh, still uh, managing to to work uh, seamlessly in in a in a in a, a industrial setting in in the us as well as you know working on their farms during the day so lots of different things are happening so We, we we have to see how the situation evolves and how the government comes to the table in order to encourage more and more uh, people to get to get to that. The next question is from our good friend Mr. Rajaram, who's a registrar of uh, uh, at the National University of Singapore, and uh, he asks, coming from India and established a successful business in Singapore, what's your advice to aspiring entrepreneurs who want to do the same? I think it's a uh, Singapore generally has always been welcoming to people coming in, uh, in setting up businesses. So in terms of uh, uh, you know whatever you can do to get yourself established, Singapore is among the most business friendly countries in the world. There's going to be lots of uh, I think there are opportunities still. We do see individual uh, in Indian businessmen in in all kinds of sectors coming in to Singapore as a, a, a to set up a global 
uh, you know, global outreach, global headquarters. And, uh, you know, I, I don't see why uh, there uh, cannot be more and more uh, uh, individuals, more and more businesses from India establishing uh, headquarters in Singapore and uh, and using it to reach uh, ASEAN as well as, you know, uh, reach other parts of the world that are accessible from Singapore. We now move on to the fifth section of uh, today's conversation. The first question is going to be from the audience again. A student, Mr. Charan, who's doing a second year ECE at SPC. Charan, please go ahead. Sir, uh, they have acknowledged that they have some bad things. Okay. All right. So let's let's move on then, uh, uh, Mr. Vijay. Uh, the UN has declared 2023 as the International Year of Millets. How are millets, millets beneficial for providing food and nutrition security? Millet is a big uh, is part uh, is a big component of African uh, uh, agriculture. Basically, because it's a hardy crop, tends to grow in uh, in conditions with very little water, and uh, generally, I think uh, that's one of the reasons why the UN has focused on it. Just like uh, they they declare the pulses to be the the uh, the UN year of pulses a few years ago. So it essentially it'll mean uh, a number of uh, uh, activities surrounding the use of millet in uh, in in the diet and in in various uh, uh, various forms. And I'm sure that uh, countries like uh, Sudan, countries like uh, uh, Nigeria, a lot of the West African and East African countries. Do grow millet. I think India also grows a substantial amount of millet. Lots of uh, uh, food manufacturers, like you know, the likes of Pepsi, Mars, all these guys use a certain portion of millet in their ingredient component, both for fast food as well as for breakfast cereal. The government of Tamil Nadu has been particularly keen to reach out to the Tamil diaspora globally, and they've been doing this in various different ways. They've even set up a an advisory board that I happen to be on as well, in order to advise the government to uh, to reach out and increase its investments into the state. What do you think needs to be done in order to increase the connect that the government has with the diaspora, especially towards developing the rural economy and the farming sector? I, you know, the, we were all members of this Pravasya uh, Bharatiya Divas, which, which was set up about 20, 25 years ago. By the federal right. government, where, uh, where you know they they interchange. You know this was this was you know many many years ago. But the the concept was one conference in Delhi, and then another conference in one of the states. I remember coming to one in Chennai. the The idea behind that was to showcase different states and see enhance their capabilities. And in those kind of uh, uh, the uh, in those kind of uh, meets. What uh, the government did was to present ready-made uh, projects which were of importance to the uh, to either the state government or a particular government. They also showcased, uh, in addition to being present uh, when it was done and when it was present in Delhi, they showcased various governments, various state governments, and it was a huge uh, success, particularly with the number of uh, uh, overseas guests that came. It was. It was sometime in January, I think it 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 coincided with the date that Mahatma Gandhi came back to India from South Africa. So there was there were uh, uh, I think there were substantial benefits that came from having the diaspora come to one place at one point in time. And I think the Ramana government should should also conduct an event like that, particularly in the second half of December or the first half of January, when a number of people come. For various uh, events, the climate is also in Tamil Nadu is probably salubrious. So it, it, you know, organizing a day session or a day and a half session could be of great, uh, uh, you know, importance as well as would be of great interest to to people who are visiting you know, Tamil Nadu. Absolutely. In fact, Siki, the Southern India Chamber of Commerce, we conducted a, a program like this in in October of 2020 where we had close to 4,000 people from the diaspora come in onto the same platform. But this was done virtually. And uh, Siki has been uh, 
working with the government to try to see if this can now be done on site. Uh, we've given a few proposals uh, to uh, the government and hope that uh, we'll be able to, to see it uh, soon enough uh, and also look forward to your participation as things happen. But uh, talking about CSR as part of our society connect, uh, Mr. Vijay, you have uh, been supplying the United Nations World Food Program with more than 10,000 metric tons of pulses and rice each year. And at the same time, you've also been sponsoring the Tirvamur Titans. And all of this has been part of your active so, uh, corporate social responsibility. How did you get started in this journey? Basically, we have always believed that we have to give back to society in one form or the other. So there are a few things that we've been doing over the years. Uh, we, you know, in India, water is such an important part, a component of our business that, uh, you know, over the years we've been supporting, uh, you know, water restoration, pond restoration projects. We've done some in Tamil Nadu, we've done some in Maharashtra, in other places. We've uh, supported some kids like 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 what you mentioned in in terms of uh, uh, sporting uh, activity. We have uh, uh, we have been you know during COVID we organized donations of uh, ventilators as well as some of the some of the other uh, needs that hospitals rural hospitals had uh, required. We generally in Singapore we support the art, so we've been uh, we've been regularly bringing. Uh, we were one of we we were one of the uh, few companies that right at the start of Esplanade we we brought one of the first Indian uh, events to Esplanade, and that's something that we do regularly year in and year out. We've been uh, supporting the memory of uh, uh, one of Tamil Nadu's, uh, I mean uh, one of the South India's. The premier artist Mandalin Srinivas's uh, memory year and every year we support an event uh, honoring him and uh, remembering him. So these are there are various different uh, uh, parts of uh, what we do uh, globally. Uh, we support uh, 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 a charity in uh, in Singapore, which uh, which basically takes care of uh, women who are abandoned by the husbands who have uh, no vocation for this, this, this charity supports uh, them and teaches them a vocation to be able to stand on their own feet. So lots of different things that we do, and we very much believe that TSR is, is uh, very, very important. You know, uh, some of the stuff that we've also been doing is in terms of uh, research that, that, you know, for years ago we supported a, a research program in uh, in uh, the Queensland Institute of Technology, which was to produce uh, a better variety of pigeon tea, more uh, disease or uh, disease resistant and uh, and uh, uh, drought resistant variety of pigeon tea, which have been very useful for a country like India. So those are the kind of things that we've. <laughs> this now brings us to the last question for today. You've been on both sides, meaning the Indian side as well as the Singapore side. What do you think Singaporeans should take note in terms of the various developments that are happening in India? And also, what are the key ingredients of Singapore's success that uh, India should take note of? I think India has been, uh, India is of course very important to Singapore. You know, 7 or 8% of Singapore's population is of Indian extraction. So obviously, it's a country that uh, that is within us. So in a way, I think uh, you know everything that's happened that happens in India is of great importance. If you look at the straight times in Singapore, you'll you'll find at least ten uh, percent of of whatever news straight times carries is in India. So obviously, uh, I think uh, Singapore for for India for Singapore, India is very very important. Both you know, India is very important even in the area that I am in as a supplier of food for Singapore. India is very important because, you know, all the major Singapore organizations like DIC and Tamasic have a big footprint in India. In the last, uh, uh, I was reading something that was a couple of months ago, which said that Tamasic has been increasing their footprint in, uh, in India. At the same time, they've been marginally reducing their footprint in China. So obviously it shows what, what importance India Holes in the Singapore team of things. I think uh, this week our deputy prime minister is also visiting uh, 
uh, India as well. There are lots of uh, contacts on, on multilateral fronts, not necessarily governmental. There's also so much of business uh, uh, contacts, and uh, that's that's something which is which has continued over the years. Various chambers in uh, in India have had uh, branches in Singapore, like uh, uh, CII and others. So there's been there's been a continuous uh, contact. We I myself was part of the Singapore India Business Council as well, which meets regularly every year to discuss what opportunities there are and what thing, what uh, things can be done in India. Recently, there was there was a seminar in uh, in the northeast of India, I think, in Assam, which was which which uh, which uh, a senior minister from uh, Singapore, Tanam Shanmugaratnam, addressed. So lots of different uh, things that are, are happening on very very multiple fronts. There's a Singapore India Foundation which looks at what youth in Singapore and what youth in India can do together. So lots of uh, different uh, things are happening. You know, as far as uh, India is concerned, you know, Sing the, the Singapore is a very small country, so it, it's very difficult to say that, hey, you know, India has got its own, uh, own uh, considerations and its own uh, uh, reasons for following the various policies that they do, but usually in in there are in Singapore every policy that is uh, that is pursued or enacted is thoroughly debated among the government in Parliament debated exhaustively outside of Parliament within the think tanks and then uh, brought into uh, brought in the into Solution is in the form of a policy. So usually there's a lot of a lot of buy-in in in policy, and perhaps once something is is enacted, everybody gets down to work and making sure that it's reality. So usually you'll find that the that that the the the, the time frame between the start and and uh, finishing of 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 anything that it that Singapore embarks on is is usually done in a timely fashion. Everything, you know, Singapore every now and then will decide that this this is an area that we really want to focus on. For example, as an international center for education, a few years ago, a policy was set. Lots of institutes came in, and then we have a we have many international institutes here, and we have a number of international students coming to Singapore to to embark on their educational journey, similarly a lot of research and development, IP protection, all those kind of uh, uh, work is done in Singapore. There's lots of, uh, uh, you know, seed funding, annual funding that's done in Singapore, even for Indian companies. So lots of, lots of things that are happening on that front, and I think India can, can take a leaf from Singapore's book, uh, book, as well as I think there's, there's, there is healthy room for collaboration. Thank you very much, Mr. Vijay. It has been a wonderful talking to you and exchanging these, these ideas. Appreciate your time and, and patience in answering each of our questions. It's been my pleasure to participate as well. And I look forward to visiting you the next time I'm in Chennai. Thank you very Certainly. much. Certainly. And as a continuation uh, of our uh, discussion, we would, uh, uh, as, and as part of the Siki 360 series, we have the uh, uh, the the habit of uh, requesting our guests to autograph their photograph. So we will have this uh, given to you at the earliest opportunity and requesting you to autograph it and also affix today's date so that we'll be able to keep it as part of our memorabilia. Also, as part of your uh, discussion with us today and as a token of our appreciation, we would uh, like to give you the certificate. This is from uh, the Kanchi Kamukoti Child's Trust Hospital, which is based in Nungambakam in, in Chennai and uh, providing uh, EOMAN service to uh, the underprivileged community. They particularly service the uh, children uh, from underprivileged uh, families uh, taking care of the medical expenses at a very low rate. So Mr. Vijay, we have taken the liberty of contributing in your name to this hospital so that this expense can go towards meeting the medical expenses of a child from an underprivileged family. We will also have the certificate uh, given to you at the earliest opportunity. Thank you again. Thank you very much. We really appreciate that. Mr. Vijay for joining us. Uh, we would like to appreciate uh, Mr. R. Rajaram, Registrar National University of Singapore for uh, today's uh, session. 
uh, sir, uh, he put us in touch with Mr. Vijay Ayangar and I'm glad that uh, uh, he was able to support us with uh, today's uh, initiative. I would also like to share with uh, each one of you that uh, uh, this is the culmination of uh, the second year of Siki 360. Within Siki, we are extremely glad that we've been able to achieve this uh, milestone. It is significant. We have not had any program in uh, in the history of Siki of how that matter in any chamber to, the, to date where uh, a single program has run continuously without any break for uh, uh, two uh, consecutive uh, years and that to 24 sessions month on month without any break, as I said, uh, said again. Uh, it has been wonderful to, to host 24 different guests, eminent guests, each, uh, each one being a significant player in the respective industry. The slide that you see in front of you have been our guests for the first year, spanning all walks of life. And for the second year, again, we've been able to continue that with another uh, colorful set of guests who have shared with us their all round paths to excellence, including, of course, Mr. Vijay Ayengar uh, today. We are extremely grateful for uh, being able to put this uh, together. This would not have been possible without uh, the active working of the Siki 360 committee. This committee is led by Mrs. Valli Arun, who's the chair of uh, uh, the Siki 360 committee. She's president of the Wellingro Group and trustee of the Tamil Isai Sangam. The co-chair of this committee is Professor T. Murugavel, head of the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at SVC Chennai. Mr. Gokul Santanam is Senior Vice President of Emphasis, who takes care of the marketing work of uh, the Siki 360 series. Mr. Amalan Alavandar is Environment Consultant Asian Development Bank, who is in charge of uh, the, uh, the online session moderation for the Siki 360 program. Ms. Vilasni M. Arun is a student of clinical psychology and brings in the student focus into, into Siki 360. Mr. Vinod Solomon and uh, Mrs. Bhavani Srinivasan, who are the Secretary and Assistant Secretary of Siki. Again, because of the wonderful work that this committee has done, we've been successful in this so far, bringing in new audiences every time into each of our monthly programs and continuing forward as well. We are very appreciative of this committee's efforts. We would like to share with you, friends, that the next 360 program, session 25, has already been scheduled. This is with Mr. T.S. Krishnamurti, again, another stalwart who has uh, made wonderful contribution to uh, to India and uh, society at large. He has been the former Chief Election Commissioner of India, and he's also been the former Chairman of the Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan in, in Chennai. This uh, session is scheduled for uh, October 13th, tentatively, 4.30 p.m. IST. We request you to please mark your calendars and, and join us. This is scheduled to be online again. Thank you very much, friends, for, for joining us uh, this, uh, uh, this morning, India time, and uh, this... Uh, afternoon Singapore time. It has been wonderful having you with us. We certainly look forward to your ongoing participation with us. Wishing you all safe times ahead. Thank you. Nandri Manakkam.